Okay, hi. Hi, viewers. Welcome to another edition of Theory Wave Nights and our first, uh, what I'm calling, art talk. So a talk with an artist around issues of culture, society and politics. I have here Alessandro Rolandi, born in Pavia, Italy in 1971, uh, moved to Beijing 17 years ago or so. Um, and he's a multimedia artist performance artist, researcher, curator, and lecturer who's lectured in Paris, in Italy, Shanghai, Beijing, in various uh, international contexts. Uh, as an artist, he deals with social issues, particularly the boundary of what one can uh, convey as an artist in his uh, chosen, how can we say, uh, his chosen city, his chosen country of China, He's currently joining us from France. Uh, he's been in the last few months from Beijing where he witnessed a semi-lockdown. Uh, he then went to Lombardy, Lombardy in Italy, where you might say, why would he do that? But um, yeah. <laughs> it was before there was any kind of uh, sign of the coronavirus. He then got almost locked down, went to France for personal reasons. <laughs> And he's now there. Went to Paris, shall I say, and now he's, I think, was it yeah. Burgundy? In Burgundy? Yes. So yes. he has some experience of the coronavirus and, and in any case is, uh, shall we say, a kind of uh, cultural analyst, uh, as well as being an artist, <laughs> somebody people look to to describe uh, these kind of situations. Uh, so we're talking, we'll be talking a lot about the coronavirus in relation to art and to uh, new media and and uh, politics, basically. So, Alessandro, how are you doing there? Uh, you, you seem well, so you seem to have escaped the uh, virus so far. Yeah, I've escaped it uh, three times and uh, I haven't been contagious. So, like, you know, so far, <laughs> so good. Uh, but I've been into a sort of... Uh, uh, catching up with the virus, like uh, living Beijing in the after uh, ten days of uh, semi lockdown, and then catching up in Italy for for work and meetings with family, and then Paris, and so it's been quite uh, it's been quite a quite an experience to to witness all of this from from the beginning in China and then to this uh, wave coming to Europe, yeah. Sure, I mean, I guess, I guess the Western audience, which is pretty much uh, probably most of our audience, uh, is gonna to want to know how China differs from Europe in, in, in its handling um, mm. of the coronavirus. I guess medically is one issue, but more as we're speaking to mm. you uh, from a cultural perspective or simply how did it feel in China as opposed to how it felt in Italy as it was unfolding? Yes, well, the, you know, the, the problem with China and people who haven't been to China is to, uh, to be able to convey the two things, the complexity and the scale of things, the way they happen in China. So uh, when, when we're dealing with what happened in Wuhan, uh, we have the, the the main perspective is like you have this uh, uh, small outbreak coming out. This medics and doctors who try to warn the central authorities, and then this uh, local authorities and central authorities that, for the traditional kind of dialectic in a bureaucratic and uh, authoritarian country, they delay the information and delay the, the outbreak. And then when the outbreak becomes huge and they cannot hide it anymore, they start turning on this machine of the social mobilization. And, uh, and this is something very important when we, when we talk about China. You know? Just like, okay, China is a place where you have all these people and the government uh, beating on them and telling them what to do. And, and actually the, the relationship is much more complex. And in the recent years, obviously with Xi Jinping, the, the government has become more and more authoritarian, more and more centralized. But that doesn't mean that it has this ultimate control on 
the mass of the people. So uh, what has been very interesting for me to see is after probably the pollution, this has been even stronger as impression, as to see how uh, when the outbreak come out, when you can see a politicized society and a mass mobilization, which happens for different factors, of course, because of the authoritarian pressure for the need to change the narrative, like uh, they have been late and then we, the government push a sort of mobilization to turn it into a, a heroic agenda. But at the same time, there is the people capacity in China to be extremely pragmatic and to f organize their own networks very quickly. So in, in, you know, in the semi-lockdown situation that I, expect, I experienced in Beijing, what was interesting is that the, the contagious was still far away, the numbers were very small, but the city was already almost prepared without the official rules in place. Like uh, everyone was organizing food delivering in a more or less uh, uh, you know, official way. And, and so I, I was grasping this kind of uh, scale of what was going to happen. And that was you know, it's it's a kind of energy, is a kind of uh, 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 cultural response that is very different from what we can experience, like uh, in uh, in the West and in Europe. That there is this kind of speed and 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 magnitude of every process that you're dealing with in in the society, and and the factors are. Uh, really different ones. Of course, you, you're dealing with an authoritarian society, so there is a, a certain dialectic between people and the government, which is uh, also not so predictable. Like, there's many people who don't trust the government, but there's also people who uh, follow the government. You know, like, and uh, the society is politicized. So that the education have been politicized. So despite the disengagement that might have happened through the development of uh, the, this authoritarian capitalism and the idea of making money, but there is still a sort of uh, uh, some, I would say, collective unconscious instincts towards mobilization that are easily, like I think in psychology is what, they're called triggers, you know, like, and so whenever there is an emergency and let's say maybe this emergency can be caused by the structure itself, which is too centralized and has all these problems of transparency and bureaucracy and power, uh, power uh, dynamics. But then once there is the emergency in place, then it's quite uh, direct to activate these triggers and turn on all this, all the society into reacting. Okay. And, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that this is something I, I think very hard to comprehend uh, to somebody in Europe or I, I imagine yeah. in the States. Um, yeah. Just to kind of get some context, I met you, Alessandro, in China on a research yes. trip with the group European Alternatives, who are kind of arts yeah. and politics and how can we say they're, they're a kind of non-governmental body who 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 fund yes. uh, research projects and and art projects uh, around social issues and we were there with a few other researchers you obviously live there already the researchers were, were from across uh, europe and um i think well my my overriding feeling and i was one of those people who hadn't been to china before from the research group and uh, we were looking at things like alternative education systems, ecology, uh, art and mm. politics, uh, how the Chinese dealt with these issues with the assumption that things would be heavily censored. But my overwhelming, overwhelming feeling was one of uh, freedom, there being uh, a lot more freedom than I thought there would be, and it being kind of hard to gauge in respect to Europe because at that point, uh, in 2012, uh, Europe was becoming less and less free. It was kind of a militarization of Europe's uh, city centers. 
in response to the terrorist crisis, but it seemed actually it was in response as an excuse by the government, but they were kind of using this to uh, impose their mm. their power to kind of to scare people a little bit. Okay, of course there there is a terrorist threat, but it's diminished um, in recent years, and yet um, you know this military presence is still there on the streets. And there's been this kind of not just military presence, but a closing down of uh, some kind of central roads in places like Rome and Paris. Uh, the placement of um, how can we say, like uh, traffic restrictions, um, uh, you know, the kind of big concrete uh, yeah. blockers, how you know how you call them, but they kind of ruin the look of a place and they and they kind of, they make it harder to navigate around as a crowd, so probably are quite handy for closing down protests. Um, another thing they did in Rome is they started putting security on the main churches and cathedrals. So you can't just literally walk in freely, which kind of makes the whole place feel a little bit different um so i mean you know these kind of measures um were coming in europe so so actually being in china didn't feel like hey wow there's you know there's this heavy feeling of totalitarian control but actually the thing is the people are very kind of open and they seem spontaneous in their actions um and there seems much more a, a culture of negotiation uh than one would imagine coming from britain or italy or other places in in, in western europe um so i think you know the, the, cause, because a viewer who hasn't been to China may just be assuming that China is a place that feels constantly heavy and and under control, but uh, it's not quite like that, is it? Well, uh, you've tasted it in still one of the uh, interesting moments. Uh, I, I must say, with the change in the government in the Xi Jinping rising to power, uh, there's been uh, significant changes and uh, constrictions and also gentrification has progressed a lot. But uh, what I can say is like my experience from 2003 uh, until 2013, 14, at least with uh, when the uh, big wave of pollution came in, it was a very contradictory, organic, complex situation in, in which... Uh, really, you use the word negotiation, and uh, that was really the case for everything that was happening there. Uh, both officially and unofficially, all the projects, the artistic, cultural projects that were uh, organized, sometimes grassroots, sometimes through uh, growing institution, sometimes from Western uh, initiatives, sometimes from mixed initiatives, all share this quality that uh, they could, they might or not have happened, but that depended basically on the will of people, on the capacity to seize the moment and to be able to uh, to use those windows and those moments or those attitudes of the government at the time in certain in certain situation that allowed to push for boundaries, to push for, um, you know, this kind of unclear territories, like using the public space uh, for years was quite interesting in China because unless you were doing something you know, caricatural in terms of the provocation. But if you were just engaging with the people and the public space in a way that could be poetic, provocative, you would have an interesting curiosity coming back to you. And at the same time, you would get the tension that you were dealing with a delicate situation. And then this has, uh, has allowed a very, um, you know, very rich exchange between people and cultural operators in Beijing for, for several years. And in, in my personal experience, uh, the change of the government with the arrival of Xi Jinping obviously has changed the rules of the game, but also another element, because you talked about public space and you talk about um, militarization and and we're talking also about urbanism and architectural point of view. So I, I would also introduce the, the concept of gentrification. Another element that has contributed to 
to make uh, even Beijing tighter and less organic and less uh, less contradictory in the way the territories and the agency were negotiated was the gentrification. So you, if you combine yeah. gentrification and and more uh, centralization of power, more ideology coming in, uh, then we've seen how the ground for that lively uh, experimental social space that existed has been eroded slowly. Okay. But, I mean, this is interesting because, I mean, we can really say that gentrification has advanced, has, has accelerated in Europe in the, same, in the same time period. I mean, gentrification mm. coinciding with um, measures brought in uh, to deal with the terrorist threat um, has really changed the face of London, for example. London and Rome, two cities I know uh, mm. very well. Um, such that in London, you know, a lot, a lot of the rock bars, a lot of the, the places that alternative culture would congregate, uh, such as the, the as again, again, uh, the rock bars, the guitar and music shops, um, the bars in general around Soho area uh, in the centre, um, got closed down in, in quite a short period. And this is all happening as uh, roads were anywhere, anyhow, being closed down as heavily kind of geared up uh, militarized police were appearing more and more on the streets so this is like a pattern that seems uh global and of course could could be global um because it follows global capitalism no mm. yeah um, yeah but yeah the from again from my experience there's the, but there's always this delicate line when you're talking about china that you know comparing the totalitarian and the democratic world but um in direct observation and to your daily life uh, what you experienced even in, in beijing was like this growing speed acceleration of the economic uh, processes that basically push the life of the cultural operators and all and let's say of all the people who are basically looking for this uh, um, pockets where you can really try to do experimental encounters yeah. or but or random yeah. encounters. Let's, let's get yeah. to culture uh, shortly mm. uh, because you're an artist there and, and you've understood mm. uh, maybe the restrictions placed on culture or maybe even the ambiguity mm. of, of, of this um, but before we get there, I mean, we've talked a little bit about the kind of um, the heaviness of the feeling at the outbreak of coronavirus as you were in Beijing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, one can understand that on kind of a, a meta level, um, but on a kind of personal level, one assumes you were feeling this in terms of uh, very domestic type situations, uh, shops being shut. Um, mm also you know through the media so i just want to focus a bit on the media the media response in china and um in italy um mm. so you know how, how was this feeling i mean do you I, I guess you're following you follow the chinese media the state yeah. media there um so and how was the feeling there was, was there some difference or was it kind of similar the, the kind of messages coming across the sense of panic that you described to me at one point well Again, like entering on the communication, there was obviously this uh, tension because the government was trying to make everybody um, feel safe, but uh, that's not possible in a place where uh, having a, the kind of communication and an authoritarian government, nobody reacts in following blindly. So it's just like there's something going on. What the extension of this going on uh, we have to find out so there was for instance this media called Tsai Xing that's a, a, a local media that was implanted in Wuhan uh, from the beginning and it was communicating in a very precise very accurate way from the beginning and uh, no matter if some of their posts maybe could be erased on WeChat or like turned down after a while but they were extremely active and extremely precise in trying to 
communicate, broadening, telling what was going on there. And then there was this kind of storm between the authority, the central authorities trying to uh, shape their own narrative, but all these uh, uh, groups in WeChat and all these uh, uh, blogs, all these uh, uh, local newspapers. So uh, again, from uh, opposite from what it could look from outside, uh, there was a lively de debate that was obviously censored, but again, we're talking about the internet. So as long as a post has two, three minutes to circulate, it circulates among millions of people, you know, like, and then it generates discussions and group discussions. And so there was um, uh, a lively debate. Uh, it was clear from the beginning that something big has happened. And uh, and on the terms of uh, compared to Italy, like was your question, uh, what I saw, but you know, I'm living there, so uh, uh, it was kind of expected. Was this immediate reaction? Like even in cities very far away, even in discussion groups, everybody would start saying, "Okay, this is something big. Something's going on. We're going to prepare." You know, like this so, this in, kind of in China, yeah. pragmatic. This is in China, yeah. This pragmatism, this like, you know, like directness. While uh, when I arrived to Italy, uh, my experience was like, oh, people are looking at the science fiction movies. You know, like okay, there's this thing going on in China. It might circulate because it's obvious that you know the virus that is like influenza and is has such a an ambiguous nature. Yeah, I mean, this there was this definitely there be... was this feeling. Um, <laughs> I can say, um, I mean, I'm constantly in contact with people in Italy because I lived there. Um, just for the the viewers, I lived there for I think ten or eleven years until two years mm. ago. Now I live in Finland, but uh, the major part of my Facebook feed is is in Italian. Uh, so out of two thousand. Um, Facebook friends, as we say, 80% uh, or so are Italian. And then actually most people I communicate with daily probably are still Italian. Um, mm. I, say, I say that by meaning online, most people I'm speaking to in Facebook chat or, or, or WhatsApp uh, are still Italians. Um, otherwise, I'm speaking to a few Finnish, a uh, few English, some Americans. Um, but I, I kind of witnessed this, and also I know it being English, uh, people kind of were like, yeah, you know, it could get could get bad, but there was a feeling that it could be a bit like the Mexican swine flu or SARS, you know, something that kind of flares up and then it, it goes away. So this has kind of caught people uh, by surprise somehow. Yeah, it, it was caught by surprise, and we have to give it to the Italian health system and yeah, and to the Italians uh, or the Europeans, that's uh, for sure. Um, but still, I, you know, there's uh, this kind of uh, attitude, like it's, it's not about us, you know, like it's a kind of, it's something uh, mm -hmm. that's happening over there might eventually come here, but it, it's not well, something is, that's going um, to be a concern. Like, it's like the know? language of Trump, where Trump called it the the Chinese. Yes. Uh, what yeah. did he actually call it? A Chinese flu or Chinese virus? Or Chinese virus? I guess he said. Um, he called Chinese virus several times, and yeah, or this foreign is virus. I find a lot. Um, you know, there's like this this African wind that comes to Italy every year. It's kind of hot, slightly muggy wind. And they say, well, yeah, it's the African so, wind, but of course it can't be African once it's in Italy, you know. Yeah. But, you know, these things yeah. kind of stay foreign. I know what you're saying. There's definitely the sense that this is somehow a foreign thing, even when it exists, is very tangible in your country. It's still not really real. It's not your thing to deal with. Um, not the authorities. I'm not saying the medical people who, of course, you know, yeah. are trying really, really hard. I'm not saying necessarily the governments, but there's a general kind of, Feeling, of course, Trump said it, but Trump is like, yeah, he's a president, yeah, of the, yeah, so he should be yeah. not saying these kind of things. <laughs> Whether he's really thinking, oh yeah, it's just some Chinese thing. I mean, who really knows? But hopefully, he's not really actually uh, in control. In America. No, no, but I mean, it, you know, I had all these uh, 
friends and relatives also from Italy calling me, writing to me and say like, oh, you know, run away, run away. What's happening there? You know, how, what that thing. And then once arrived to Italy and I was saying, you know, the thing is going to come over here. And, and it it felt like, yeah, okay, okay, but. And uh, there's also something to something about what happened afterwards like the authorities were caught by surprise the the re- response was not uh, fast enough and ultimately we were ending up doing like china you know like i mean uh, the, all this uh, kind of uh, advantage that we had in time but also in the conceptual level where it seemed that we could be able because we are a transparent society because we are a democratic society all these kind of tropes all those kind of you know that are also realities that we could have been advanced to to prevent or to prepare for this that was happening actually they all failed and ultimately we 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 found ourselves with a communication that was the mediatic communication was also uh, pumping fears and contradictions, yeah. uh, but yeah. also the the leadership communication was like that. The government was communicating well, every yeah. every I mean, ten this hours. This has been reflected you know? um, <laughs> exactly in the UK now, where where ah. you know we had this time, we had more time than Italy. We had like Italy being you know fairly close geographically to to the UK, but also having a similar um, size population. We had this kind of mm. almost test case. Um, this example anyway, which we could follow. And then we, you know, the, the British still kind of uh, screwed things up and they were very complacent and they ended up kind of bumbling, uh, reversing the original idea, which was to kind of make most people sick uh, on purpose, hoping they would <laughs> yeah, build up yeah. immunity. Um, the herd. The herd immunity, um, which made them seem like kind of Nietzscheans or something. Yes, um, yeah, very... <laughs> But um, nostalgic, yeah. Um, <laughs> they almost seemed like it's what they'd always been looking for, but then suddenly they didn't want that anymore. And then apparently, you know, because they were told by a university, uh, I forget which one it was, um, in Britain, they were, they were running research. Oh, well, if you do like that, you're going to lose 250,000 people. Um, so then they, they said the science has changed. We realized how many people would die if we let everyone get it. But the thing is, this really, I don't buy this because actually they said in the original press conference where Boris Johnson suggested that we should just let it go through the population so mm. 60% of people can be affected. He said that we could be losing up to several hundred thousand people. Um, mm. So I don't think he panicked or his his uh, cabinet panicked upon realising how many people would die. I think they just realised how deeply unpopular that idea would, that idea was. Which which seems odd. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I see that. I mean, uh, I, I agree. I've seen, obviously, Trump was even more explicit in, like, his, his press conferences, uh, apart from his 200 words vocabularies, but mm-hmm. were, you know, 40 minutes, 38 minutes talking about stock exchange and CEOs and corporate uh, uh, mobilization and two minutes talking about uh, the the elders or the issues that could affect the, the Americans. So I mean, the same happened to, with, yeah. Sure, it doesn't seem to be much of, of a plan, though. This is what we could say overall, is that um, you know, there, there, is, there are these ideas emerging that, okay, um, so it's going to be a bit like terrorism. I mean, I've already gone through this in a way, so I'm, I'm kind of mm. also spreading this idea that people can now implement new laws, they can kind of announce emergency laws, which may just stay in place. Um, so it's possibly a power grab. But it doesn't seem like any of this has been planned for in the long term. It's certainly not a thing of like, let's spread mm. a virus, panic the public, or let's invent a virus even possibly and panic the public. Yeah, well. um, and uh, then we bring in these kind of laws and things. I mean, it seems, it seems more opportunism. It seems more what uh, is called disaster capitalism. Yes, um, yeah, yeah, I totally agree. There's been so many... Uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, inventions about the origin of the virus, and and we, but you see, uh, what what emerges from this is like the weaponization of the of the communication. 
you know, like a, more than the, uh, the sort of conspiracy or something, what is emerging is how at a certain point, one word like can be Trump using the word the Chinese virus or lately uh, the Chinese have been trying to push it to Italy, for instance, because we, we have some research of uh, some strange pneumonias in November. So um, the, the, the way in which the communication has picked up on the crisis and has tried to uh, orient the narratives it's uh, the real kind of uh, uh, real kind of uh, imminent, like the, the event that's been happening that we we, we witness, and obviously uh, the like you say you mentioned disaster capitalism, like shock doctrine or like Naomi Klein, that's for sure. But this time it's always it's been lived earlier in the media, like you know, like some of the governors uh, in Italy. Receive notice of the measures of the government of the central government through the media, not before. You know, like and when they receive it before, they leaked it out to the press. You know, like so. I, I've been recent, uh, really interested in uh, how the, you know, the communication has been weaponized and and turned into a tool of, of a war, like in a way, you know, like political war. Uh, okay, so thinking about your activities as an artist and, and about the art world in general, um, let's just start by, by framing, framing your work before we think about your work in relation to what's developing and, and then more generally about the art world uh, as such. Um, so I suppose your, your main project, or the one possibly that's fed into your work most consistently, over the last years has been uh, social sensibility, no? Yeah. yeah. Uh, which is a project yeah. uh, where you run a residency in a factory in China called Bernard Controls, or that's Bernard yeah. Controls. Yes. Um, and, uh, okay, well, just tell, tell us a bit about that. Uh, yeah. Well, that was, uh, the, happened uh, an, an encounter with this, uh, uh, factory group and a family uh, owned company uh, they happened in 2010 and uh, I was dealing with the issue of working in the art and life connections and the public space and because of the availability like I can say like that there was a, a position of listening and interest so I I was able to negotiate the creation of a department. So it is a project, but it's also like a, a mimetic department within a company. So we call it social sensibility R and D, uh, and uh, basically it consists of having a, a current and long-term interactions with people at work during work times. Uh, which is ba based on a dialogical exchange and a sort of very organic and improvised uh, discussions about uh, work, life, and art. Um, and uh, this, the thing that I've negotiated is that the time that we spend doing these activities is, uh, first of all, is voluntary, so it's not uh, is not uh, enforced in people, obviously. But then is is can be time taken from working time. So uh, the the time spent with us will not be on a break, but it will be on uh, working time, and it will not like uh, be uh, recharged on the on the duties. And the other thing is like from these interactions that take place some uh, creative activity and works or projects come out and this project also do not belong to the company but they belong to the people who have been involved so sometimes can be artists and workers sometimes just workers and uh, along 10 years we we have been able to uh, yeah uh, brought together a lot of experience and interesting moments and the also we have somehow 
engaged with the art world as the window because it's the only window. So we've been able to bring uh, uh, artworks and uh, projects done by uh, workers and non-artists into uh, uh, public institutions, museums and galleries and Okay, I mean, it, it makes me think of your, your practice in general, um, mm. knowing something about your work, because we have worked together. Um, yeah. You came to, well, you actually so you sent your work to Rome in 2014. We had this show uh, yes. called Subterfuge, which I curated. We had a few international artists dealing with, with issues around art and politics, art and subversion. We had... Um, I think we had Oliver Rezla, Stodilat, the Russian art activist yeah. group, and you were one of the artists there. And you you sent this piece made of um, sweet wrappers, no? Based on sweet wrappers. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. the wrappers you have on, on candy. So can you just explain <laughs> yeah. uh, the logic yes. there? <laughs> well, that was uh, I, I going to flea markets in China. And uh, uh, I don't now remember exactly who told me that... Uh, uh, candy wrappers during uh, times of the Cultural Revolution uh, were some of the few colored things that people used to collect and keep as a, as a form of, a, well, you know, kind of small collecting or aesthetic pleasure or even to have something that was, uh, that had a, a special colorful appearance in a world that has become all regimented and, and, uh, and so I started to buy these wrappers in the flea market and then through Home Shop which is uh, like a interesting initiatives, independent researching initiatives that was on Beijing, I first uh, activated that into um, a marketplace when I asked the Chinese people attending this market to write a message for Westerners on the candy wrappers and then those messages, uh, some printed, some original, were the ones that were in the, in the project that you curated. And so, again, we, I was working with this idea of the, the poetic subversion, the, the reality around yourself, and the idea of smuggling, you know, smuggling a message, smuggling, uh, 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 creating a bond through this kind of escamotage of this kind okay. of ruse, I mean, the playful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it ties into the theme of that show where, where, we, where we put this work, there'll be an image uh, when we broadcast this on YouTube, I'll put an image here. Um, so the image we're seeing now, uh, the, the theme of the show that this was in uh, was kind of like how one can... Uh, how one can change debates or have discussions or change policy through stealth. So the show was called Subterfuge, mm. as kind of a, yeah. you know, this word yeah. meaning a kind of slow or uh, covert um, upending of the, of the social system. So this, this thing of like sending messages on sweet wrappers um, is linked to, is linked to this, this idea, but also your work in general, I see that you kind of like, you hijack a social situation or you do something that that has this kind of seditious um, intent, but it also is slightly hidden somehow. Like uh, I, I recall you did this yeah. in China, but also in uh, also in Palermo, Sicily, when you were there for Manifesta, the European biennial, which moves around Europe and every two years is in a different city, but was in Palermo this time. I curated this yeah. three or four day event um, called Politics of Dissonance, and, and you had a group of people from Social Sensibility um, come from France, from China. It was like a big gathering, people that hadn't travelled often, sometimes factory workers from China and France, and they all took part uh, in different art happenings. And one was when you had this, uh, how would you call it, like Chinese calligraphy, you were yes. writing on <laughs> the pavements, which you've also done in, in China, I saw before. Um, yeah. I mean, well, that's me... a practice, no? That you know, it's a practice of calligraphy in the parks, and obviously, it's it's very tempting. So, <laughs> uh, but as as the same, I, I allow myself to 
there is a discussion I'm always having with Chinese friends uh, with the idea that uh, that that's about. I mean, you know, in China that everything is written with characters on paper, on the wall, or with water. So there is this uh, culture is written in China. Like, you know, like if it was big generalization, but, you know, the written word is very prominent and very important. And, and the way we disseminated the sentences, because most of what we wrote were uh, sentences collected from uh, these uh, conversations with workers in China and in France, and all of a sudden to be able to turn them into messages that could be there, could be erased, could evaporate. Uh, but they have, a, for me, they have the same liveliness as those conversations, you know, but they also have a sort of plasticity and, and yeah, yeah presence. More, I guess what, I, what I'm getting is that you're pushing boundaries in a place where the penalty, the penalty for going beyond the boundary is severe in China, but the boundary mm. is not always clear because it's this kind of society of negotiation, although you're saying it's getting stricter. But it seems your practice is one anyway that ties to the role of our art and politics, that art and politics anyway is in this tentative space of like, we're making political statements, but we're not because we're making art. Um, so mm. you're kind of, to me, you're testing this I just want to show a video. Basically, it's the, the beginning of gentrification. Uh, beginning, it's been, again, sorry. It's been an ongoing process. But like, there's a artist village that have been destroyed. And it was not just an artist village. It was a, a, a real village. And uh, I decided to make this kind of uh, sarcastic golf game for uh, a whole afternoon with a friend so we were pretending to really play golf and to until the last hole which was a big hole mm -hmm. and uh again uh if you want we we were there and uh, to go around these places maybe if you go around with a very uh clear uh intention you might get stopped or they might take away your camera or not letting do what you were doing but to go around and doing something apparently silly or or kind of that's not necessarily spotted in the first place uh, allowed you a certain uh, you know a certain amount of freedom and at the time i i called for people on the first of may to clean a square uh, as boys did just that there's no demonstrations in China, so we cleaned the square, and we were foreigners, and uh, and we had we were surrounded by people trying to understand what we were doing. Is that, and is that one here on video as well? No, I I, okay. I actually there's no documentation. There's only a picture. Well, when you, when so you say that, just just to make that clear, you mean like the piazza, the piazzas, the public squares. Because yeah, you're saying on, on, it was a national holiday, but there were no protests. There were no, what do you say? No, People because, made, of, you know, the 1st of May is May the day. workers' day. Yeah. yeah. You would expect but there to China, be some kind of protest, but there's yeah. not in China. So instead there's of like not. making a protest to kind of push a boundary, you actually cleaned up the piazza. Some yeah, piazza. we cleaned the square and we were only foreign artists, Asian and and in Europeans. Uh, so the action was very, uh, very interesting because somehow it is provocative. So you, you had people checking on us, but at the same time, the gesture was so, uh, you know, okay, we're just cleaning and uh, we were foreigner also. So we were in the middle, uh, still probably at the apex of when the foreigners were allowed almost uh, everything unless they were really, really, really rude. So there was a lot of, you know, small provocation overlapping layers. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think this kind of things would be possible in uh, with the change of governments. You know, like we we almost stopped doing those uh, because the gentrification came in, but also because of that sense that you develop. Like you know, this word of negotiation is also a, a word of instinct where you kind of 
develop a, a sixth sense to understand what is possible and what is not possible. And, and this is a point that is often criticized by people who advocate like a full freedom of expression. But in terms of uh, dealing with, uh, uh, with the public, with people and with the reality, um, I'm still on my side that this kind of being naughty, like the subterfuge, exactly like you're talking in your, uh, in your uh, show that you curated in Rome, uh, it's something where there's something with which you can reach out to more people. You can trigger more of that kind of will into people. And yeah. uh, I'm and, interested and in that. Yeah. And I suppose that's something that is coming to the fore a lot. Uh, it's, it's becoming apparent uh, in online culture. But before we get there, yeah. we'll get into that. But the, the, the spinning of, you know, one can't maybe change something huge, but one can at least provoke thinking or you can like show people that you're there I, i'm also there i also support uh, a left-wing vision and and this is something mm. that's going to become all we have for a few weeks because nowhere can we go outside and protest uh, so we're in that position yeah. so we're thinking about that there was in italy there was a show of solidarity or there's various different shows of solidarity uh, from these people who can't go outside currently for the coronavirus there mm. was this practice of singing from from balconies um right and actually i don't know but i imagine one of the songs that would have been sung was this bella bella ciao bella ciao the partisan mm. song uh which yeah this is kind of a kind of a weird shimming in li link into this next video but uh, which you also sang uh in palermo in manifesto in the event there as i mentioned earlier this four days of performance uh, from international artists dealing with politics you you brought as i said before the social sensibility group there, uh, workers from China and from France, and you had this kind of karaoke session, which we're just going to see yeah. now. I mean, that being a kind of sign that, you know, people are there for each other. It's only karaoke, but uh, there was some kind of feeling if you were there while watching this of some kind of like solidarity in any case. Yeah. Yeah. What you have here is different yeah. songs from different countries, yeah. Yeah, songs and uh, coming from uh, different countries, different cultures, different African dialects, um, Eastern Europe, China. So, again, uh, it's a pretty direct way to give voice, you know, like we were always talking about how to give voice and then into the idea of art as a activism and engaged we're talking about giving voice and then you know sometimes there's nothing more direct than just especially hijacking karaoke which is something so uh, uh daily routine probably more for asian than westerner but it, it also worked very well with the community in uh, in bernard france because people contributed and felt uh, I would say like you feel, you feel empowered and at the same time you don't feel that sense of heaviness that might come when things are, um, uh, you know, too serious and don't use that sort of, uh, I don't know if I can go so far, but I think there's something also regarding uh, desire, something erotic in this way of being naughty, of hijacking, you know, there's kind of pleasure also. That is an element that I, I, I really appreciate. Yeah. I'm seeing, <laughs> I don't there, know. <laughs> there is that aspect of um, there being some kind of pleasure. By, I think it's because you're not really, one is not really putting themselves in danger. So there's that aspect of like mm. a lot of mm. middle class people, not in this case, because you have people from different backgrounds working with you and you do mm. generally want social sensibility, but many art projects that are political you have mainly middle class people who kind of toy with these difficult subjects but aren't really getting themselves in any actual trouble. Um, so yeah. 
there you go. I mean, it's a bit like uh, dressing up as I don't know what people do because I don't really dress up. But I mean, people <laughs> may dress up as a as a fascist or something and, and commit some kind of sex act or something. But they're not really doing it. You know, it's kind of an acting out of things that one. Yeah. One isn't going to get yeah. in trouble for so much. So the art world is a little bit guilty of this. I think it's there's a problem. It has. Uh, it's, it is kind of perverse. Um, and, and art kind of is that space that, that feeds a, a desire for these kind of safe objects that maybe signify something risque, but you don't really get in trouble so much. Um, and, and I wonder whether the online space is becoming superior in that regard. Um, it actually, not, in, not because it's any more dangerous, because it's even more of like a space yeah. where you have objects that actually don't really involve you in any real action. But having said that, anyone can partake. You know, whether yes. you're working class, middle class, you can you can put out your memes that do nothing. Uh, they're still they're doing nothing, but then they're doing something because anyone can make them. So that it already kind of gives you that democratic aspect. So I mean, I'm, I'm kind of finding the the the, ra- the realm of the meme, the world of, of of digital online culture somehow more fulfilling at this stage than uh, the concrete art world. It's because I had so many experiences with. Um, these super wealthy people who were kind of seeming to be playing a bit of a, of a game. In fact, Politics of Distance was like my, my swan song almost. It was my last like, really <laughs> strong uh, art event made how I would make an art event because then I did a couple of things after which weren't as, as strong. But anyone who was at Politics of Distance would know that it was almost a uh, failure on its own terms um, because, because it, it was, as it said, it was a four day party. Um, <laughs> techno and performance party yeah. in in a art biennial which was supposed to kind of like bring a kind of quite aggressive element that you don't normally see into that biennial but did actually end up looking exactly like what it was emanating at a squat party or you know a dingy mm-hmm. kind of illegal party or something um with kind of cheap uh, beer by the glass wine by the glass or whatever um and um, but on the other hand, it kind of was explosive and did something because it was so dirty and messy. Uh, you had to be there. Uh, maybe I'll put some pictures up for the audience. But um, um, nonetheless, kind of worked. But I mean, since then, I've been more in the online realm. Um, and I'm finding this the coronavirus interesting because it's bringing a lot of people online who weren't. I mean, galleries are doing this because galleries can't open the gallery to buyers. So there's a necessity yeah. to make online shows, but other elements in the art world are doing it, but also uh, just um, you know people generally are making stuff. I, I don't know what kind of meme culture existed in Italy, to be honest. Strangely, I haven't really looked at meme culture apart from noting that uh, Salvini <laughs> and his followers are big <laughs> users of memes, which is probably what kept me away. Um, so there's a right wing kind of meme culture, a bit like in America there is. But I didn't really know what's happening um, more generally. But I have noted now there's been a lot of, uh, uh, how can we say, coronavirus memes that seem to be made just by, you know, by people, you know, by average people, not people, uh, mm. by that I mean not people who call themselves artists or who um, seek to be online influencers. And I'm just going to watch some here yeah. to get an idea of what I mean. Um, yeah. So here's... Should I show that one? Yeah, okay, let's show that one. Here's one, yeah. which I subtitled so the English audience can understand it. Ciao ragazzi, so che è un po' da egoista, ma non ce la facevamo più a sopportare lo stress. Abbiamo trovato un volo da, da Roma, siamo andati via e mi dispiace. Ci vediamo tra boh, tre mesi. State attenti, state a casa voi e guaritevi. <laughs> okay so unexpected uh yeah S- spontaneous yeah it's like uh <laughs> just leave it there um but i mean just kind of silly you know not not really high yeah. art not uh meme not kind of like dangerous teenage meme angst uh something else entirely so there's that one and then there was this one and let's note that they're very Italian in their humour. 
uh, to me, but I hadn't seen this so much until. Uh, hang on, what's happening here? There you go. So I, I don't yeah. know if I, there's even anything that tells me that's Italian, but I think it is Italian. But the guy looks Italian. Yeah, it looks Italian. It's, uh, okay, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of sort of trying to bring elegant into his messiness. Yeah. And then there's this final one. <laughs> They're just very simple. Um, yeah. I mean, almost like seems quite antiquated as a sense of humor, but it's still somehow funny. Uh, but I'm thinking more just like the way this is so lo fi, so completely out of any trend uh, associated with meme, with meme culture. Um, yeah. So, you know, maybe this is one kind of legacy of, uh, of uh, the coronavirus, but more and more people <laughs> will just be putting stuff out there, which would be a good thing. Um, well, I mean, in, in, in my view, I mean, extending it this to online, but it's also a, 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 a general feeling that I had when I, when I was living in China for a while. And then, the, I mean, life has become more extreme. What's happening in life? What's happening in the in an image production online and also in certain countries, even if you just walk around? What you see, what you witness is sometimes more overwhelming, more complex, more extreme, more radical than what you can come up with after reflecting for a few weeks on the studio. You know what I mean? Like, so uh, to this, I, I'm interested in this freshness and this kind of spontaneity uh, that the, the line, uh, the uh, still uh, internet still offers. Uh, I'm sure the, uh, you know, grassroots original internet artists and activists probably say that the internet is also now completely hijacked by power structures. But uh, in this production of images that is done by people everywhere in every moment, I, I found uh, uh, still valuable uh, tool of uh, you know reflection sometimes a provocation sometimes also like uh, some political messages uh, i'm thinking also uh, about the there was this uh, phenomenon in china for a while the, the jibo so there was this um, uh, live streaming where at the very beginning the platforms were many and they were not regulated so uh, they were there were a lot of people streaming their daily activities, their silly thoughts, uh, advertising what they were doing, and also for a while, uh, a little economy that was going on because everybody was paying every somebody else to to keep doing their thing with emoticons that were actually real uh, real money. So obviously it it became very easily like in the seduction or in the uh, salesman entertaining a, a nice girl. But on the other side, you had families advertising their own daily life, their own small business, their own, and always with this creative act, this provocative, small, um, uh, you know, kind of sketches and, and I heard that uh, that culture has been taking over then from developers and curators. And so now the contents of those platforms have changed. But it uh, feels like there is, there is still space for the online uh, activity to develop strategies. And these strategies are not even like uh, thought over. They're like just spontaneous reactions. Well, this is, you know, this right? is the thing. Um... I suppose what one would call um, in the Baduian sense, from Alain Badu, the, the event. Mm. And I, I always mm. find this funny because it's too easy to say. 
and I wouldn't <laughs> want to. I wouldn't want to have to be an Amber Jew, or maybe I would. But I mean, this thing, this temptation must always be, be to declare everything as an event. Uh, but basically, an event means you, you have extraordinary circumstances, and they, they, they. I mean, there's actually some maths behind it. I never really understood because Bert Jew tends to kind of insert mathematic equations into his into his theory. But an unexpected event pushes for a, a previously unimaginable reality, or an unexpected mm. occurrence pushes for an, an previously unimaginable event, which he would call literally like the event. I mean, your understanding of Bert Jew may be better than mine. Um, well, uh, yeah, well, uh, he's been elaborating a lot uh, around the, this idea. And um, I, yeah, uh, I mean, to my understanding, the online culture is still, is still my perception, not really understanding. I don't pretend to go as far. Is one step forward in the sense that is also something that belongs to the generation who born in the 90s and you know like so to a certain extent is like uh, uh, still difficult to to be grasped and recuperated by even by our generation and I, I find this mm. uh, liberating in a way you know like I, I, I the way I address memes and internet culture is not the same way my daughter does it you know it's sure. not the same way art students born in the 90s do it but it's not the same way those who are born in the 2000s are doing you know yeah that's that's a kind of different Things. level of uh, yeah well it's changing all the time yeah but i, I suppose uh, my, my kind of thinking is that um you know, things are emerging from this, from from the coronavirus, maybe also from online usages. Um, that's always happening. But, you know, completely unexpected uh, situations such as the, the Cuban, um, well, I mean, it probably happens regularly, but it doesn't get such media attention. The, the Cuban um, uh, medical corps going into Italy to help them. We can see the meme up here, which I actually made yeah. a couple of days ago. <laughs> um, which says I chose the psychedelic red pill. The red pill is the is one of the two pills offered in uh, the Matrix. The red pill is the one that, that kind of gives you the, the <laughs> okay. truth, which may, may yeah. be a harsh truth, but yeah. you know, reality. Okay. I suppose uh, that a lot of what's happening, a lot of what's uncomfortable about the coronavirus is due to to profit making, to profiteering, to to capitalism. Shall we say that that major choices are made? Like, well, do we want to cure everyone, or do we do we want to close down? society hence uh, controlling the virus when it might uh, damage the economy etc then you get the cubans coming in to help the russians actually that aren't at all communists but i mean yeah. in the collective <laughs> conscious somehow maybe are seen as communists still um chinese some kind of semi-communist chinese yeah but actually now they and it's not been reported it's hardly been reported at all which makes it even more interesting the socialist republic of vietnam uh, also yeah. have been helping um, so you get this kind of this event that upends uh, our normal understanding. Um, which hmm. I but what your what yeah. is your yeah? I, I've also been even really from the surface. It's like witnessing something completely different. You know, like the basis like this. Uh, uh, enemies or third world countries or like you know this otherness that now are the you know are near us and they're helping us and then like and so it's it's like compared compared to the stereotypes we've all grown up in the you know 80s and stuff and it's kind of refreshing to see this this change although we we know that this has okay political uh, agendas and stuff but yeah. I'm in the sense of the event I found this absolutely refreshing you know like it, it's it's almost like hey things can go differently then I'm not you know like I don't know if it's better or worse you know yeah. what I mean but but like breaking that sense of of uh impossibility to 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 change well, that, that what's going on you know positive you there know? was one thing I don't know if you can see it there no, it's not. It's not going to work because I have this kind of funny effect on my camera. Uh, no, uh, maybe I can Google it. So it was Dalla Rus Russia con amore. Have you seen this? Uh, no, no. 
Um, <laughs> there's a film with the same title, which was James Bond, James Bond film. And yeah. what's going to come up here is From Russia with Love. Okay, I think I'm going to get actually what I'm looking for, not uh, something off uh, Pornhub or something. Um, yes, I've actually got what I'm looking for and not something sordid. Okay. Um, so basically, the military vehicles that are in Italy now, I think they actually end up going through Rome. Um, perhaps they're in the north of Italy. They actually have written on them, from Russia with love. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a very, like, a triple layer. <laughs> well, true, because actually it's the name of a spy film. <laughs> yeah, which exactly. Was, which would have been very anti-Russian. I think it was an anti-Russian uh, I mean, film. But the, also the thing you see, like, is to to be rescued by China and Russia, and and to see uh, at least the, on the on the chat on the social media a lot of people uh, advocating for that, or calling for that, you know, like because there is an intellectual level where you're analyzing this, and then this very straightforward level where people are living this. It's uh, very contradictory, you know, like, you know, yeah. like, what, what, well, it, well, is it the beginning of another kind of influence and how this influence will be deployed and what it will mean for, you know, for, for, for Europe, you know. The, I mean, the Cubans arriving was very interesting. Did you see them? They arrived obviously on a plane, but then you had the ramp down from the plane and they came down they were linking arms and they had some kind of banners saying solidarity or something. It was all very, yeah. it was a very strong message of, of solidarity and socialism. Uh, it was kind of bizarre to see and of course well, very powerful but then somewhat suppressed in, in the media. Um, yeah, I mean that's also what I, I witnessed very quickly in, uh, in China, like how uh, you know, I can tell you that the the person who takes me to, uh, to the factory and brings my kids to school sometimes came to bring me masks. You know, like uh, when when the outbreak started in Wuhan, uh, all the people were like uh, organizing, asking who can do what, and this kind of of. Uh, um, um, you know, kind of mobilization is is really is really touching in a way because that's that it will happen. You know, it doesn't happen uh, because just there is a government uh, hiring fist. It happens because it's uh, wired, even in a society that has a lot of contradictions. Because Chinese are not like Japanese or Korean, where you can definitely feel a more um, embedded sense of collectiveness the chinese have also a kind of crazy a bit uh, you know kind of uh, a bit anarchist side of of them you know which is uh, but in, in moments of need there is this uh, uh, yeah this this capacity to self organize and creating networks uh, informally and yeah, that's very touching. Very, and then you know when it's vehiculated through the official language, of course it it has different readings, but that doesn't take away that uh, I guess the uh, quality of the message of of uh, support and and uh, uh, yeah this idea of a, of a just society of a socialist society. I I take it for good i don't take it as a, you know like a, just propaganda you know kind of <laughs> yeah there, there may be something uh there may be a new solidarity arriving from all this we, we will have to see uh but with that i yeah. think will be it will be a nice a nice place to to leave discussion hoping that we we see this manifest so thank you for joining us yeah. and hopefully we can uh chat again sometime soon yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's been nice to uh, use the current situation to also think back to the moments we've shared and the previous projects and, yeah, now reflecting on... We can, yeah, maybe yeah. think of other projects, maybe online is a good yeah. place to start. Online. For now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.
Okay, I look forward to that. Cheers.